Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar presentation. This is actually the first session, the first in a series of Gray Learning webinars for 2017. I was traveling for the first couple of months of the year, but very happy to be kicking off the Gray Learning webinar series once again. And this year we have some new friends joining us. Tamron has sponsored the Gray Learning webinar series for this year. And so thank you very much to Tamron. We'll be talking more about that shortly. Today's topic is long lens tips and techniques. I'm Tim Gray, of course, as many of you I'm sure already knew. And so I'll be sharing some tips, some techniques, obviously, related to the use of longer focal length lenses. And along the way, as we'll talk about in a moment, I encourage you to submit not just questions, but also your own tips. What sorts of ideas do you have for how you can best put long lenses to use? So I want to start off again by thanking Tamron for sponsoring this webinar series, the Gray Learning webinar series. And I want to encourage you to check out, there's actually a project going on right now, the hashtag with my Tamron. And so if you are a Tamron photographer already, you can share your own photos, some of your favorite images captured with the Tamron lens using that hashtag on your favorite social media site. And also check out a user gallery, essentially, at the Tamron USA website. That website address shown right there, tamron-usa.com slash special slash with my Tamron. And you can see a nice gallery of unique and interesting images. And as I mentioned, I want to encourage you to share your own tips. This was part of the webinar description, in fact, and you can post those tips into the questions field for the webinar platform here. And of course, if you have questions along the way as well, I will do my very best to answer as many of those as I possibly can. I will focus on the questions that I actually know the answers to and do my best to find answers for any that I don't know the answers to. But before we even launched today's webinar, I already got a couple of bits of feedback and a tip from a viewer. Frank Leaf provided a, a great tip, actually, one that was not included in my original plan for today's presentation. And he tells us when he's got a long lens on one camera body, he'll have a wider zoom lens on another body so that you're able to switch back and forth between a long focal length and a shorter focal length very quickly and easily. That, of course, requires that you are carrying two camera bodies with you, but if you are, that is a great tip to make sure that you're able to switch very quickly from a long lens for a distant subject to a wider lens for a closer subject without having to go to all the trouble of changing lenses and without adding risk of getting sensor dust, for example, inside of the camera. All right, so let's dive into some of the tips and techniques. Some of these will relate to, literally, techniques, how you use your gear. Some of them will relate to how you choose your gear in the first place in terms of long lenses. So let's go ahead and dive right in. First and foremost, I think it's really important to remember exposure basics. Whenever I'm talking about a particular subject, or whenever I have a photographer ask me, about some kind of narrow range of a topic related to photography, I try to keep in mind this notion of kind of stepping back and remember, don't, you know, don't forget about, for example, exposure. You're going to take out a long lens and capture a, a scene, a subject from far away. You still want to get everything else right. So while today we're really focused on things that are specific to using longer focal length lenses, don't forget about the basics of exposure and, you know, photography basics in general. This is actually an, an image that I've been using lately as part of a trick question of sorts, you might say, a pop quiz. What would be the appropriate exposure? And what I find many photographers don't realize is that with the moon, at night, if you want to have the moon actually exposed properly, now this can be a challenge in terms of dynamic range if you want the moon plus the foreground scene exposed properly, but if you're just photographing the moon, the exposure is actually pretty simple. It's a rule that I call the overcast 8 rule. No, it's not overcast today, or I wouldn't have had a chance to photograph the moon, of course. You're familiar, I'm sure, with the sunny 16 rule that says if you've got a nice sunny day, then you'll probably get a good exposure by setting your aperture to f16 and using a shutter speed that quote unquote matches your ISO. So at 100 ISO in theory you would use a 100th of a second shutter speed at 400 ISO, a 400th of a second for example. 
But on an overcast day, you lose about two stops of light. Well, as it turns out, the sunlight reflected off the moon and coming back down through the atmosphere of the Earth, that too translates into about two stops of light loss. So it's the same as an overcast day, and so I term that the overcast 8 rule. So set your aperture to f8. So in this case, this was with a 600 millimeter focal length captured at f8. My ISO was set to 1600, and so I wanted my shutter speed to be at approximately a 1600th of a second. The closest match was a 1500th of a second, which is what I used here. So the key is not so much to memorize what the exposure settings are for the moon, but rather to just remember that you don't want to focus exclusively on one specific topic, such as getting a lot of reach with a long lens, forgetting about some of the more fundamental topics in the process. Also, speaking of forgetting, don't forget that a fast shutter is not always what you want. When we're using a long lens, by definition, we're probably going to want a relatively fast shutter speed because now we're taking a small view of the scene. We're going to magnify any movement. This would especially be true if we're shooting handheld. But even if you're not shooting handheld, if you're shooting, photographing a moving subject and you're on a tripod, you either have to time your shot perfectly or more likely you're going to be panning with that subject, as would be the case here. And so you assume, well, I must need a really fast shutter speed. I want the fastest shutter speed I can get in order to freeze all the action, except in this particular case, I certainly froze the action. That's about a, that, not about, that is a 2,000th of a second shutter speed. And now it looks like this pilot is having a really bad afternoon because that propeller doesn't seem to be turning at all. And so if we think about the actual subject, the needs of the subject first in terms of shutter speed, as well as all of our other camera settings, we can be a little bit more thoughtful even though we're using a long focal length lens. In this case, for example, the focal length set to 400 millimeter with the plane coming at me at about 100 plus miles an hour. I want a fast shutter speed in theory, but not too fast. In this case, going to a 1 350th of a second it's a relatively fast turning propeller that gives me enough of an exposure time where I can get a little blur in the prop and still have a sharp overall photo. And so again, just don't assume that you always want a fast shutter speed because you're using a long lens, even with a moving subject. And then when it comes to photographing those moving subjects, one of the shooting modes, the exposure modes that I use the least would be shutter priority mode. And yet sometimes shutter priority mode actually makes a lot of sense. Now, conceptually in this particular type of a situation here, photographing a crop duster again out in the Palouse region of Eastern Washington state, conceptually I could shoot manual mode, except if you notice all these different angles, my subject is not always in the same lighting. I'm not always getting the same light angle. And so actually there is a degree of variation. So if I were shooting manual, I would need to make some adjustments along the way, depending on where the subject actually is and how the light is falling on that subject, especially because there's a fair amount of reflection. It's a somewhat shiny airplane, you might say. And so there's a bit of variation. And on some days I might have mixed sun and clouds, for example. And so, those are situations where I might want to let the camera do a little bit of the work for me. And therefore, instead of, for me personally, if I'm not using manual mode, I'm usually using aperture priority mode. But when I'm using a longer lens, sometimes that shutter speed becomes more important. And so I might actually prioritize shutter priority. Now, one of the reasons that I generally prefer not to use shutter priority mode is because that means that what's going to change in terms of exposure settings by and large is going to be the lens aperture. And there's a shorter range, less range of lens apertures than there are shutter speeds. And so with shutter priority mode, there's a little bit more risk of running out of apertures essentially. All right, so a couple of questions here. I see that we've got uh, is that Lisa? Lise, maybe? Uh, what focal length did you say to capture the moon? That moon shot was at 600 millimeters. And that I will come back to actually a secondary point in just a moment. So hold on to that strictly for just a moment. But it was a 600 millimeter focal length. Uh, and then when it comes to ah, the, the solar eclipse. Yes, well, first of all, for the solar eclipse, don't look... 
into the sun. And the tricky part, the trickiest part, I would say, about the solar eclipse is that that exposure is changing fairly dramatically. And so you'll, generally speaking, if you're metering off the sky, then you can, if you want a little bit of detail in the sun, go to about a minus three stops exposure compensation. But as the moon starts to cover up parts of the sun, the light levels actually will drop somewhat significantly, and you'll want to start bringing that up just a little bit. I don't, I, you know, one of the things that I've not kept up with is what's going on in the sky this year, because I've been so busy with other things. So I'm not sure if that's a total eclipse or not. So if it's a partial, then you'd have less of an issue there as well. <clears throat> All right, so coming back to the question about the focal length for the moon, I said that it was a 600 millimeter focal length, and that is true. That happened to be with the Tamron 150 to 600 millimeter lens that I was using on that trip. You see the crop dusters here out in the Palouse, all sorts of great photographic opportunities. And so that was at full 600 millimeter. However, in addition to that, I was using, in that case, a camera that has a sensor that is not a full frame sensor. And so you might say that that gave me a little bit of an extra advantage. Now, this has been such a contentious topic. It's a tricky topic to talk about because some people want to focus on the technicalities. Am I getting more focal length? Is it somehow turning my lens into a magically longer focal length lens? And no, of course not. What's really happening is you are literally just cropping the image. And so if we use a camera with a smaller sensor, if I use a full frame camera with my, let's call it the 600 millimeter focal length that I photographed the moon with, on a full frame camera, that is 600 millimeter. So this is all, of course, talking about 35 millimeter equivalents, essentially. So if we assume a full frame camera with a 600 millimeter lens, we get the behavior of a 600 millimeter lens, obviously. But if I then take that lens and put it onto a camera with a smaller sensor, then I get a multiplier effect. Now, the way we talk about that, it's as though I had a longer focal length lens. That's just a convenient way to talk about it. The lens is still the same, but the image circle that is projected by the lens is now being effectively cropped. I'm only capturing a smaller portion of it relative to or compared to a full frame sensor. So I'm taking a smaller piece of the frame. I'm still using the full resolution of that image sensor. I'm just taking a smaller piece of what the lens sees. So a convenient way to talk about that is that we're getting a mul multiplier effect. I am capturing then in that case, the same image that I would, what's that math, a 960 millimeter lens as compared to 600 millimeters. And so that's giving me conceptually an advantage. And so in many cases, if you're focused on capturing distant subjects on using longer lenses, if that's going to be a priority for you, then a camera with a smaller sensor could make a lot of sense. And it can certainly be helpful. Now there's a downside as well, the same effect making your lens kind of sort of behave as though it had a longer focal length, again, just by cropping the image circle. That also means that when you're on the other end of the spectrum with your wide angle lenses, that you're not going to have as wide a view as you otherwise would. So there's a little bit of a sacrifice when it comes to wide angle lenses. There are, of course, some digital lenses out there that are aimed at compensating for that. But again, it's a decision you'll need to make based on priorities and, you know, to the point earlier, maybe you're going to have two cameras with lenses on each, then you'll use your smaller sensor with the long lens and your full frame sensor with a wide lens, and then you've got the best of both worlds. A uh, little more gear to carry, of course, but then you have more flexibility as well. But again, if you're going to focus on distant subjects, if you want as much reach as possible, keep in mind, when you're choosing your camera body, a camera with a smaller sensor will give you that extra reach by virtue of capturing a smaller portion of the image circle. When it comes to actually choosing your lenses, I guess it goes without saying, but of course you want to choose carefully. And really what I mean by that is not so much being careful per se, but choosing based on what actually is important to you. What are your priorities as a photographer? And so when it comes to the overall attributes of the lenses. I mean, first and foremost, today we're talking by and large about 
using longer focal length lenses. So how much reach do you really need? So the way I like to think about this is, first of all, what do you already have in your bag? What sorts of focal length coverage do you have? And I find most photographers tend to have, again, talking about a 35 millimeter equivalent, somewhere around a 16 to 20 something millimeter at their widest and somewhere around 200 or 300 at their longest focal length. Obviously, every photographer is going to have different sets of gear and different priorities. But then thinking, okay, well, how much reach do I want? And that, by and large, depends on what sort of subjects do you want to photograph or do you typically photograph. If you're going to photograph birds in flight, then I would say get the longest lens that you can afford. If you're going to photograph flowers, maybe it's less important, although I'll talk more about that a little bit later. But the point is to try and think about what sorts of needs you might actually want to fill. Do I need something that's on the really, really wide range? Do I already have pretty good coverage in a particular range? And in the context of long lens photography, it really starts to become, okay, how much further can I push this? How much more reach do I want to have? There's some other options, some other considerations there, of course, that you'll want to think about. Uh, but first, before we move on to that next point, the crop duster photos. Uh, actually, two questions. I love I love those crop duster photos, and I love photographing the crop duster, so I'm happy to see that we're getting questions related to those. Uh, first and foremost, uh, follow up on which lens was used. And so that has been, for the most part, just about exclusively with the crop dusters. I've been using the 150 to 600 millimeter lens. And that we'll talk more about some of my reasoning there in a moment, but mostly that's about that reach. And I'm fortunate that when we're out in the Palouse, I've got a, a good friend who's a crop duster. I can coordinate with him. And so we know where he's spraying and we know which way the wind's blowing so we can get ourselves positioned close, but not too close. And so we're able to use modest focal lengths, you know, somewhere around 200 millimeters generally works reasonably well. But with that long reach, I've got so much flexibility to be able to, when he's coming toward us, for example, start off in a distance and time my shots based on, you know, where he's spraying, etc. And then in terms of the metering there, what I'm typically doing is metering it's one of two things, metering off of the field, the wheat field, which typically acts as a reasonably good gray card, and then locking in a manual exposure, obviously always checking the results to make sure that I've got a good result. Because then I'll typically use manual exposure if I'm going to be shooting in one direction with consistent lighting. And so, for example, some of those shots, you'll see the crop duster coming right at me, and then he's going away from me as he does his pattern, his racetrack pattern. And so... In that type of situation, I'm only shooting when he's coming toward me or going away from me so the light angle is the same. So if the conditions are consistent, then I'll use manual and just lock in those settings. And then in situations where there's a bit of variability, then I would use typically shutter priority mode, locking in either a 250th or a 350th of a second shutter speed, and then typically a half stop minus exposure compensation and letting the camera do the rest. All right, so back to some of those considerations for lenses first and foremost know your limit and this limit changes over time i can tell you from personal experience when i was so much younger carrying lots and lots of pounds of gear lots and lots of glass in my backpack seemed like no problem at all and now as i'm getting a little uh, older Suddenly it's not quite so easy, so I'm starting to be a little more picky about what goes in my bag and how many lenses I'm bringing with me, and so I'm trying to be a little bit more strategic. Part of that relates to getting there in the first place, so I don't like, of course, as I'm sure many of you, I don't like to check my bag when on a flight when it contains camera gear, so I'd rather carry all that on. That means putting all my gear in a backpack that I can carry on board. That makes for an unpleasant walk through the airport. But, uh, of course, then once I'm at my destination, I have what I need. But also, beyond just the packing and traveling, feeling you know the size and weight, what are you comfortable with? Are you going to be shooting handheld? Even on a tripod, there's a degree of bulk involved. So being thoughtful about those overall considerations, and that'll bring us back to another point that I'll touch on shortly. But one of the best tips, uh, two pieces here that are related, one of the best things that I can tell you when it comes to trying to know your limit and understand what you're in for when it comes to size and weight and those sorts of considerations, uh, 
go into a camera store and hold the lens in your hand so that you can actually feel what it feels like and you get a better sense of the operation of that lens and you get to feel the weight of that lens and if possible if you have the opportunity a great way to test out some of this new gear is to rent it first. There are a variety of services online and camera stores that rent out lenses and camera bodies. You can rent one of these lenses for a relative, I think, a modest price, all things considered, and get a really good feel. Actually get out there and use that lens and decide whether or not it is a good fit for you before you make the decision to purchase it. In addition, one of the things that I always try to look at with lenses that I'm thinking about pursuing, and this is especially when it comes to long lenses, long focal lengths, is what is that maximum aperture? And when I talk about aperture, when I talk about the largest aperture size or the smallest F number that a lens offers, what immediately comes to mind, I find, for many photographers is how narrow can I make the depth of field? But that's actually not the biggest motivation, I would say. Yes, of course, in some cases, when I'm using shorter focal length lenses, then I absolutely like to have narrow depth of field. For longer lenses, I'm not usually seeking out narrow depth of field, and usually the lens helps me get narrow depth of field all by itself. And so it's not about that. It's more about performance. It is about, number one, being able to let in more light so that I can get a faster shutter speed. But what's perhaps more important for many of us is that with a, a wider aperture opening, a lens that goes, for example, to f2.8 as a maximum aperture size versus a lens that might only go to f4, the advantage in terms of autofocus can be significant, especially with moving subjects and also when the light levels are relatively low. So in a situation like this, this snowy egret, uh, this is in Florida at sunrise, this is a situation that's going to really test the capabilities of the lens the, the lens aperture in the context of autofocus. In other words, I want to have a lens. Remember that when we're focusing, the aperture is wide open. It doesn't stop down to the setting we've chosen for our exposure until we actually take the picture. And so we're getting a little bit of a benefit in terms of that lens. So with longer lenses, I'm generally looking for a lens that ideally opens up to a maximum aperture size of about f2.8. In some cases, with, with certain manufacturers, they might have the same lens available in a couple different models where there's the f2.8 version versus the f4 version, the f2.8 version being a little more expensive. And then you need to consider, is it important to you? Do you need that improved autofocus performance? And do you need the additional light to help you get a faster shutter speed? And again, it depends on what you're doing with that lens. But generally speaking, I would say I tend to favor that better aperture option or finding a manufacturer. So for example, with Tamron's one, uh, sorry, the 70 to 200, for example, that Tamron offers, they don't have the multiple versions. It is an F2.8 lens. And so looking for a feature like that, I think, is helpful. Again, it depends on what you're shooting. If you're just extracting landscapes from a scene, then suddenly that is not so important because you may very well be using manual focus. And then the age old question to zoom or not to zoom. There's still a lot of conventional wisdom that says you should not get a zoom lens, you should only get a prime lens because the prime lens is going to be so much sharper. And to that I say, maybe a little bit. And it certainly used to be a much more significant issue, but these days the lens technology is so impressive that even with the zoom lens, you're able to get exceptional sharpness. And with the newer lenses as well, very, very good sharpness that is consistent all the way from one end of the zoom range to the other. There's still some lenses that suffer a little bit at the extremes, but by and large, that is really improving year by year. And so from my perspective, to zoom or not to zoom, the, the answer is an absolute yes, because I want greater flexibility. I want greater range. I want to be able to capture a scene in a variety of different ways without changing lenses. And I want to be able to switch subjects and to switch situations without constantly changing lenses. And when you think about the zoom, so I mentioned the 150 to 600, for example, and that is covering 
200, 300, 400, 500, 600, and a bunch of options in between. It's like having a bunch of different lenses in once, and that also gives you greater flexibility in terms of the overall composition, the scenes that you can capture. So just these very simple examples out in the Palouse, found a good canola field with a windmill up on top, some clouds. So for a while we had beautiful sunlight on the yellow flowers in the foreground and I got some shots of that. Then the clouds show up and I don't have that sunlight anymore. Now what am I going to do? Simple. Zoom in. I had the the first shot is at 150 millimeters. The image on the left there, the wider view is at 150 millimeters. And then zooming in to 300 millimeters for the photo on the right. And I have this isolated, just a windmill set against those cumulus clouds, which I think works out very nicely. And can you imagine trying to change lenses? In my case, probably that would mean run back to the van, open up my backpack, switch to a different lens, get back out to my spot. And by that time, that cloud would have probably moved out of position and I would have missed the shot. So to me, the flexibility and the ability to adjust your composition on the fly, I think that is invaluable. So even if I'm giving up just a little bit of sharpness in the process, to me personally, that's a compromise I'm willing to make because it's not with these modern lenses an issue that is really affecting my overall sharpness. And then in some cases, you want even greater reach. Now here, again, this was the 150 to 600, and you can see the shot on the left again being 150, the shot on the right being 300. If I had gone all the way out to 600, that's probably way more reach than I need. Maybe I could find an, an interesting composition there that I would like at 600 millimeters, but I didn't need to go that far. But sometimes you want to go even further. And so you might consider a teleconverter. This is essentially a magnifier for the lens. So this attaches in between the lens and the camera to give you a multiplying factor. And they are generally available in 1.4x, so a 40% magnification, and a 2x, which doubles your magnification. Now keep in mind that, as I mentioned earlier, if you're using a camera with a cropping factor, then the teleconverter might become less important or it might become a challenge. So if we assume that 600 millimeter focal length that I've referenced on a few of those photos and the camera with a 1.6x cropping factor, that gives me an effective focal length in terms of the field of view for the scene that I'm capturing of 960 millimeters. That is a lot of reach. But if I want even more, I can add a 1.4x teleconverter. That takes me up to 1,344 millimeters. Or instead, I could use the 2x teleconverter, and that gets me up to a whopping 1,920 millimeter effective focal length. That is wild. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind when it comes to teleconverters in general. Number one, you're going to lose light. Generally, with the 1.4x, you're losing one stop of light, and with the 2x, you're losing two stops of light. So you'll need to obviously take that into account as it relates to your overall exposure settings, the aperture maybe needing to crank up the ISO, again, depending on the circumstances. And also, your autofocus may suffer, and stability can be a problem. You're using such high magnification that you're now not really able to handhold effectively, most likely. At least many photographers are not going to be able to handhold a focal length of around about 2,000 millimeters. So tripod becomes important and best practices in general become even more important. But again, autofocus may suffer partly because, not even partly, mostly because of the loss of light. And again, that stability becomes a bit of a challenge. Now, since we, I've been talking about Tamron lenses, and you see here the Tamron teleconverter, uh, it's worth noting that with the G2 models, I'll talk about those in just a second, but the G2 model lenses, their second generation, the Tamron teleconverter paired with a G2 Tamron lens, the 70 to 200 and the 150 to 600, autofocus will not suffer. And so in many cases, depending on the combination of lens and teleconverter, you may be able to retain autofocus at least up to a certain limit. So you'll want to make sure that you understand those issues before you opt for using a teleconverter. But again, I would say that they can give you tremendous additional reach, but you'll want to be cautious. And so this, uh, the teleconverters, I would say in general, two things. 
Number one, I highly recommend using a teleconverter from the same manufacturer as your lens. So whatever lens you're using, I would use a teleconverter from the same make. Yes, that's a very conservative approach. It's not always necessary, but today's cameras and lenses are very sophisticated. They're talking back and forth quite a lot. And so I want to make sure that I'm taking advantage of all that the lens manufacturer has offered to make sure the communication is going to be accurate between the lens and the camera. And so I do personally prefer to, to pair lenses with teleconverters of the same brand. And then to bear in mind that compatibility issue as well. And then also I mentioned these G2 lenses. And this is a theme that I've seen recently and a theme that I am very happy about. I feel like, you know, my early days in photography, lenses didn't get much attention. A lens came out, a lens was available, that same lens was available, it felt like forever. And more recently, we're seeing lens manufacturers come out with updated versions of their lenses. So we see, for example, many cameras coming out with a Mark II, Mark III, Mark IV, you know, version update. That same basic concept applies to lenses. And in the case, just one example here, I've been talking a lot about this 150 to 600 millimeter lens that I've been using on some of my travels. There is the original on the left there, and then the G2 version on the right. So second generation version of that lens. And there are a variety of advantages. And the interesting thing is that in this case, at least, both the original version plus the G2 version are still available. The original version at a lower price so now it becomes a matter of choosing whether or not the upgrades are worth it and for many photographers the upgrade might not be worth it if the new features don't make sense to you then you might not be interested in trading in an older lens and upgrading you know paying extra essentially to upgrade to a newer lens but i definitely encourage you to take a look at what those new features are and see if they might make sense for you personally so in the case of this particular example with the g2 for the 150 to 600 millimeter there's improved optical performance and additional coating faster autofocus the vibration control that's the stabilization that we'll talk about shortly there, that's been enhanced, including a new Mode 3, which I'll describe a little bit shortly. There's a new Flex Zoom Lock, where you can lock that zoom at any setting just by pushing the rotation barrel forward. Uh, and also, might not be very obvious from the photos here, but the photo on the right, that tripod mount is integrated. It's permanently attached, and well, not permanently, but it is integrated, and you've got a, a mount for, uh, I believe, Arca Swiss, if I remember correctly, but a standard tripod mount, which I think is just wonderful as well. So again, just take a look at the different features and see what might make sense for you. Is it a worthwhile upgrade or are they not necessarily helpful? And a lot of that just depends on what types of photography, you know, the demands. If it's bird photography, if it's sports photography, then I would say the upgrades may very well make sense for you, but it just depends on your particular circumstances. Uh, really good question. So Kenneth asks, if an extension tube would have a similar magnification effect without the light loss of a teleconverter, and the answer is no, if only that were the case, because a an extension tube is much less expensive. It's a much uh, more affordable piece of equipment, certainly, but an extension tube is really just about getting closer focus. It's essentially pushing that lens a little further away. So we're taking the focal point, that focus spot, and shifting it forward. And so that will enable you, with many lenses, you can use a, an extension tube to get the lens a little further away and get your focus point closer. And what I always, I always call extension tubes the poor man's macro solution. If you've got a lens that doesn't focus especially close, you can add an extension tube and get even closer. And in fact, with macro lenses, with an extension tube attached, you very often get that focus point to be inside the lens. Uh, so it makes things very, very interesting indeed. But an extension tube is really about being able to focus even closer. Uh, good question about if you're shooting at a really long focal length, wouldn't you just focus to infinity? It is possible that focusing to infinity would help in that scenario. In other words, why do you care about autofocus if you're shooting at an effective almost 2,000 millimeter focal length? By definition, whatever you're photographing is probably far away and you could just focus at infinity. 
I'll say two things about that. Number one, infinity isn't always the best setting. Photographing the moon, for example, setting the lens to infinity focus won't always give you the sharpest image. And also, your subject might be considerably closer. Not exactly close <laughs> by our more typical definitions, but just because you are using an extremely long focal length doesn't mean you're focusing at a great distance, and so you might want to back off of that infinity setting. And so what I would say is using live view with the zoom setting, finding a, a subject that you're planning on focusing on, or at least at a distance, you can use that live view and zoom in on the live view display in order to see you know where you're at your best focus point and set it based on that all right so handheld i i know many of us say that we need to use a tripod when it comes to shooting with long focal length lenses i know some photographers shoot with a tripod always and i applaud them i on the other hand have a tendency to shoot a lot handheld I know it's not the best habit, but it's what I do. And so when it comes to shooting handheld, this shot, by the way, was captured handheld, sort of. It was a one-third of a second exposure. And as you can see, I was able to capture a sharp image even with a one-third of a second exposure handheld, sort of. In this case, it was handheld, which means no tripod. Fortunately, this was on the side of a road, and there was a guardrail there that I was able to stabilize the camera up against. Not quite as stable as I could have gotten with the tripod, obviously, because I'm still supporting the camera, but it was enough. The general rule of thumb, I'm sure many of you are familiar with you know, the concept that when it comes to shooting handheld, you want your shutter speed to quote-unquote equal your focal length and really what we mean of course is the fraction so if it's a 500 millimeter lens you want to be using at least a 500th of a second shutter speed but we also need to bear in mind subject movement so if it's a 200 millimeter lens and therefore you need a 200th of a second in theory what about when it's a really fast jet flying by that might not be the optimal shutter speed. So just bear in mind subject movement, and especially if you're on a tripod, this is less important, but shutter speeds in general, be thoughtful about how long an exposure is it, and can I really handhold that? And some of that comes down to just your own personal comfort level and your equipment. Let's not forget the weight of the lens. When we're talking about a 100 millimeter lens, hand holding at a hundredth of a second, not such a problem. When we're talking about a 600 millimeter lens, hand holding at a 600th of a second, I would say eh, you're taking some chances there. Might want to take that into account. So just bear in mind the limitations, both based on your own comfort level, the weight of your gear, the movement of the subject, and then of course the focal length itself. But the key being that with a longer lens, we're going to need to err on the side of a little bit faster shutter speed. And then also understand stabilization. I love the various forms of stabilization that are available both in lenses as well as in certain camera bodies. In the case of Tamron, for example, that's called vibration control or VC. That stabilization was turned on for the photo you are looking at right now, and yet it's blurry. And that, of course, is because the shutter speed was not fast. I would say not fast enough, except in this case it was intentional. The boat was moving very quickly ac across the water, and so the image was intentionally blurred by motion blur. Stabilization isn't going to fix absolutely everything, so don't push your luck. I recommend being conservative with the latest technology and the latest G2 version of the 150 to 600, for example. You have the potential for up to four and a half stops of benefit in terms of your shutter speed conceptually with that vibration control. I'm not going to push my luck. I still want to use a fast enough shutter speed for the circumstances. But when it comes to stabilization, so this used to be very easy. You turn it on or you turn it off. It's either being stabilized because you're handheld or it's not being stabilized because you're on a tripod and the tripod is taking, advantage, taking care of that for you. These days, of course, technology has made it better, but also a little more complicated. So, for example, with the latest update to vibration control, VC, there are three modes to choose from. And the specific options, I'll just talk about this one example, but the specific options will depend on the lens that you're looking at, the lens you're using. 
be sure to understand how those modes work and when you will want to use them. The general rule of thumb used to be, the absolute I would say, used to be turn off stabilization when you're on a tripod. I would say that that's still true much or most of the time, but there are some scenarios, some lenses where you can use it. My personal preference, maybe it's being a little old fashioned, I prefer to always turn off stabilization when I'm using a tripod but understand what those options are. So for example, in the context of VC, vibration control, mode one is kind of their standard mode that strikes a balance between the viewfinder stability so that you can see a stable view and the actual stabilization effect for the photo that you capture. Then there is VC mode two. This is used exclusively for panning. And what's happening essentially is when you go from mode one with two axes of stabilization and then switch to mode two, now it's only one axis. Yes, the lens is smart enough to know which way you're moving and it will only stabilize in one axis. So if you're panning a subject that's going left to right, right to left, top to bottom, etc., that is when you would use, in this case, mode two. Again, check your specific lens to see what the options are there. And then in the new G2 versions of the Tamron lens, there's also a third mode that prioritizes stabilization for the captured image. In other words, it will not show you a stabilized preview in the viewfinder. So you're not going to see a stabilized view. It might look a bit shaky, but you're going to get a stabilized photo. And because it's not compromising by showing you a preview at the same time, it's actually able to produce better results, and that's when you'll get the maximum benefit. I personally like to see the benefit, uh, so I kind of get a better sense of when it's working, and I can time my shot better, etc. But if you really need an extra push when it's really low light levels and you're handheld, etc., then you might want to use that mode three in this case. But again, the key is to really just understand the options that are available and how it can be best put to use. Now, of course, stabilization assumes that we're not really using a tripod. In those types of situations, be sure to brace yourself thoughtfully. So this would be an example of not really bracing myself very thoughtfully and of putting my camera to great risk of falling into the water. This would not be how you want to brace yourself, ideally. Rather, I would have preferred to pull my hand in and brace against that dock just a little bit if I could to find some other way of stabilizing myself and the lens as much as possible. So when you're shooting handheld, try, you know, brace yourself. Try to brace your body against something. Brace your arms against your body. And then kind of compact yourself and be as stable as possible. Find a position that is comfortable where you can actually move, readjust the, the framing of the scene, etc. You might also consider cranking up the ISO. Obviously, you'll look at your overall exposure settings, your aperture, but we want a faster shutter speed. And so whenever possible, understand the abilities of your camera in terms of noise behavior in general. Here, for example, this was very close to the limit at 600 millimeters. It was actually 552 millimeter focal length, as it turns out. Shooting at f8, which, you know, just generally aiming at stopping down a couple stops to try and make sure I'm getting the sharpest view possible. I want, it's not a fast moving subject, but I wanted a fast shutter speed because I'm hand holding a long focal length panning with the subject. And so I just brought that ISO up to 400, and that, in this particular case, enabled me to get a shutter speed of a 2,000th of a second, which gives me a little bit of insurance. It goes beyond that general rule of, in this case, theoretically using a 1 400th of a second shutter speed. Yes, the vibration control was enabled. I'm using that stabilization technology, but I'm not going all the way down to, you know, four and a half stops below 400th of a second. I'm giving myself a little bit of extra insurance because it's not just about the movement of the camera per se. It's the movement of the subject panning accurately. There's so many things that go into this. I want to give myself the best odds possible. And then another thing to consider, the kind of a compromise somewhere in between being handheld versus a tripod is using a monopod, which if you've never used a monopod, I recommend that you check it out. It can be shocking what an extra benefit it gives you because you have very significant freedom of movement, being able to move that camera around in a hurry, but you don't have that 
you know, the additional benefit of a tripod conceptually, but it's so much more stable. So you've got flexibility and better stability. And I always find it whenever I'm using a, tri a monopod, I always find it almost shocking at just how much easier it is to get stable shots. So for situations where you're considering going handheld, but you really know that a long lens is going to present a challenge for you, I would highly recommend getting a good monopod. It can make such a world of difference. Just make sure it's one that extends high enough that you'll be comfortable moving around, that you're not going to have to uh, hunch down too much. And then, of course, for many situations, a tripod becomes necessary, and I really can't emphasize enough how much I consider it to be worthwhile to invest in a good, sturdy tripod. It's a tripod that's going to last you a long, long time. I can hold handheld, very steady. I can get great results in a variety of situations, but even I, ladies and gentlemen, have my limits. This shot, for example, was an eight-second exposure. A tripod is required even for me. <laughs> and so there are going to be those situations where you just simply need a tripod. And so make sure to invest in a good tripod. Again, visit a camera store, put your hands on it, set it up, give it a little bit of a shake, put a nice heavy camera and lens on it and see how it holds up. Make sure it's going to be nice and stable. And even when you've got a great tripod that's nice and heavy, Way down that tripod. No, this isn't exactly a tripod. I got two legs, plus I'm leaning against a rock uh, precariously a thousand feet above the Colorado River here. But notice that backpack. That was the real point here, is that we've got a backpack helping to weigh me down so that my weight is shifted backward so I don't fall forward. Same concept applies with the tripod. Hopefully you've got a hook at the base of the tripod underneath the ball head where you can attach your camera bag, for example, with your heavy lenses in there or whatever other gear you've got. Some people even bring along a bag that they can fill with sand. The point is to weigh down that tripod, especially if there's any degree of wind. Now, be careful, though, because in some cases, if you're not careful, the weight that you're using to help stabilize the tripod in the wind can actually contribute to movement because if that wind is enough to start moving your weighted bag that's hanging there, that can actually shift the tripod, in some cases, creating bigger problems than the wind itself. So do pay attention to that. But again, the point being is to try to get as stable a platform as possible, especially when it's windy. And when it is windy, try to do your very best to block the wind. So here, a demonstration of handheld shooting techniques uh, in the freezing cold of uh, Antarctica. And it was interesting how, you know, when you approach a glacier on a ship as I was, the wind that comes off, it creates essentially its own weather pattern of sorts. And so there is tremendous wind. And so you see me standing very near the edge at the railing. When I was having a big problem with the wind, I could take about three steps back and it was virtually calm. And that made such a huge difference. So that's, a, a, in this case, a handheld scenario, but even on a tripod, wind can be such a huge problem. See if there's a way to move into a different position where the wind is being blocked naturally, such as getting away from the cliff or, you know, back away from the corner, whatever the situation might be. Or even use your body to block the wind as best you can from the lens. I've even used diffusers and reflectors as little uh, blocks for the lens on occasion to try to minimize the impact of the wind. When it comes to using a tripod, if you're going to be working with panning subjects, a gimbal head can also be tremendously helpful. It gives you much greater freedom of movement as compared to a ball head. So with a long lens photographing a moving subject, such as flying birds, a gimbal head is something that I highly, highly recommend. So I also want to talk about some, uh, I guess you might say, philosophical considerations here. Uh, some reminders to sort of pay attention when it comes to actually just getting great photos. I focus a lot about kind of the gear and the technicalities and general technique, but I think one of the most important tips, turn around. So I think that when we're using a long lens, you know, by definition, with a long focal length lens, we're getting a narrow view of the world around us. That's kind of the whole point. We're trying to zoom in on some small area of the scene or some small subject that's at a relative distance. We're going to be focused in on a small area. That's great for the lens. 
but don't forget to widen your own view. Take your eye away from that viewfinder from time to time and get a look at the scene around you. And so in this case, this is just one example of countless scenarios that I could probably come up with. This is the Hubbard Glacier in Alaska. And of course, the whole reason the boat came into this bay was to see the Hubbard Glacier. And so when we got to it, all that we, anybody was really focused on was the glacier. And it was a beautiful glacier. But then I happened to look over my shoulder and there was a very nice range of mountains. And I thought, there's another shot. There's always more shots. Even when you've got a key, wonderful, amazing subject right in front of you, look around. There's probably some other subjects you might want to photograph as well. And so ultimately, going all the way out to 600 millimeters, isolating just the snow-capped peaks of the mountains right by the Hubbard Glacier, I found a photo. Now, I was there for the Hubbard Glacier. My photos of the Hubbard Glacier I'm perfectly happy with, but I'm much happier with this photo than with any of my shots of that particular glacier. So paying attention to what other subjects might be around you. Don't forget to look behind you, <laughs> just all the way around, up and down and all over the place, paying attention, looking for what other subjects might be available. And then uh, kind of a variation on that would also be to consider some non-obvious uses. Now, what's a non-obvious use of a long lens focal length. Well, that depends on what you're familiar with. So for some, I'll give you a few examples. Some of these might be completely obvious to you. Others maybe not so, but hopefully these are helpful tips. And mostly the idea here is just to kind of think a little bit more broadly. When you think long lens, to me personally, I generally think about sports photography and about bird photography, wildlife photography, taking something that I can't get super close to and bringing it in a little bit closer. But there are also a variety of other creative possibilities. So, for example, flowers. One of the best lenses you can ever use for photographing flowers is a very long focal length lens. You can isolate an individual flower, an individual stalk, and get really good isolation with narrow depth of field. It can be amazing. And so here, for example, we have canola flowers in the background that are out of focus, nice smooth yellow backwash, flowers in the foreground that are out of focus, creating a color wash for the, the lower portion of the flowers in the midground, and then the one stalk that's in focus. And that is made possible by a long lens focal length. And then other scenarios that you might not have even recognized. So this was an interesting scenario going through the Panama Canal or in this case, just about to go through the Panama Canal. And it is a fascinating, wonderful experience that I highly recommend, but I would also admit it's not the most photogenic experience I've ever had. And so you might not think there are many shots to be had, and, but with a long lens, suddenly it opens up a whole new world of possibilities. And so here, kind of, you might say a little bit of an abstract, extracting some detail out of a container ship that was going in the other direction. The colors I thought were interesting, the light versus shadow I thought was interesting, and so using a very long focal length lens in order to extract, creating images that were otherwise not possible with a shorter focal length lens, I wouldn't have had this opportunity, and more importantly perhaps, I wouldn't have even noticed this opportunity. And even simple things, you know, I find when I use focal length, long focal length lenses more and more. I start to pay attention more to subjects that are far away that I might have otherwise missed. This very simple in a high-rise hotel at right about sunset and the windows of one building reflecting across. And this was a building that was a fair distance away, but with a very long lens, I'm able to extract some details. So it caught my eye. If I hadn't had the experience of using long lenses, and of course if I didn't have a long lens with me, this might not have been possible. And so just kind of paying attention to what else is out there, as you start to get a better feel for how much reach that lens really gives you, then you sort of start to know where to look within a scene and how much detail within a scene you're actually able to extract. And therefore, when you'll want to use or when that lens is going to be able to be put to use and what sorts of subjects to keep an eye on in the first place. And then it gives you a whole new context for the subjects that you photograph. So this is a, a glacier. This is in the fjords of Chile. And we had photographed it, of course, head on. And it was fascinating and wonderful. And the rocks on the side that are being carved out by the glacier and then the trees on the other side. But as we work our way down the fjord, 
and we're getting further away, I start to realize here's another shot, this layering of the trees, the glacier, and the rocks. And part of the reason that I like this photo is it gives you such a better sense of scale of just how huge that glacier really is. And this is a shot that without a long lens, I would have never been able to capture. And without the experience of shooting with a long lens, I wouldn't have even realized that it was possible. I would have just felt as though, well, we passed it, it's done, now I need to look for other subjects, when in fact I was able to get additional shots, additional creative options because of that long lens. Well, thank you very much for joining me today. I hope that's all been very, very helpful. And I do have some questions here, so we'll go ahead and get through as many of these as we possibly can. So uh, let's take a look here. Uh, so how important is a remote or cable release with the tripod? Could you use a mirror up option and still get most of that gain? So a good question, Gary. So how important? It depends. So the key thing in terms of using a cable release with a tripod is recognizing that the simple fact of you pushing that button, the shutter release on the camera, means that you're moving the camera just a little bit. And with a very long focal length lens, that can be magnified enough to create a problem. And so cable release, important. When is it really important? I actually have gotten to the point that I almost never use a cable release, but I still want the benefit of a cable release. And so instead, I simply use a two second timer on the camera that gives enough time for any vibrations to subside. So the only time that I actually use a cable release by and large is when the timing of the shutter is critical. So if it's a cityscape or a landscape view where nothing's really going anywhere, then I'll just use that two second timer. If I need to time it just right with a, a bird in the right position in the frame or what have you, that's the type of scenario when I'd use a cable release. So the notion of damping that vibration, of avoiding the vibration in the first place, that is very important. But I would say you could use that two second timer or you know whatever the shorter timer is that's available. I don't generally have the patience for a 10 second timer in that type of situation. Uh, and so since most cameras have that built in, that works just fine. The other reasons that I would typically carry a cable release would be for longer exposures and for time-lapse captures and those types of situations. And many cameras have those features now built in. So uh, mirror lockup, that's a good question and, and, and a good tip that could be included here as well. So I don't generally use mirror lockup, but bear with me. The reason that I don't use mirror lockup is because I don't generally need to, which is to say that mirror lockup is most effective at about a 15th of a second for your shutter speed. And so when you're using a faster shutter speed, it's less critical. Not that it's ever a bad thing. And certainly it makes sense to employ it uh, conceptually, virtually always. But I have a tendency not to, mostly just for convenience when I'm using a faster shutter speed. But for sure, at about a 15th of a second, that becomes a factor. And I would definitely employ mirror lockup. But there's no harm in using it. So there, if you even at a faster shutter speed, certainly feel free. Um, but that wouldn't help in terms of wind. So there was a question here from Vinny as well. Shooting in wind or other unstable situations, would you lock up the mirror to help reduce any extra vibration? In the context of extra, yes, of course, but that's not going to help obviously with the, the wind motion. So that would be something to take into account as well. Uh, so really good question, Michael. Maybe we'll start a firestorm with this one. So do you recommend moving your tripod collar to the upper position when hand holding? This is a common practice. So that tripod mount, the collar that you saw in the pictures that I showed earlier, many photographers will rotate that up above. Some photographers even take it off altogether if they're hand holding the lens, uh, depending on the lens. In some cases, you can take it all the way off easily. In other cases, it's not quite as simple. And so... I personally, this is me, I personally prefer to have the collar down. Uh, and actually for two reasons. Very often I like to hold that lens mount with my hand. I find it's just more comfortable. I feel more stable. I, maybe it's just in my head. Uh, so I actually hold that on a regular basis. For situations where I need to hold the barrel of the lens, such as if I can't, normally I can reach to adjust the focal length, but if I want a little bit better control for fine tuning focus, for example, then I actually like to put my hand in between the lens barrel and that uh, 
tripod mount, the collar there. So that might be uncomfortable for some, but I find that that gives me a little bit more stability. So really I would say it's a matter of personal preference. If you feel like it's getting in the way, rotate it to the top of the lens or take it off altogether. Uh, but personally, I actually like having it there. It, to me, it's a great handle to hold on to, in part because I don't really like holding the barrel of the lens. I'm always worried that I'm going to accidentally turn off autofocus or upset the, the focus setting of the lens or, you know, some such thing. So generally speaking, I like to have that on there and then actually hold on to it. All right, so a couple of, let's see, there were a couple there related to things that we've already answered. So some duplicate... Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, so question, what does Tamron say about the teleconverters for the older lens, so the non-G2 version? I don't know if there's anything more official that Tamron has said about it, but I can tell you that the that you'll have autofocus issues. The autofocus won't, it depends on the camera, I suppose, but you will not have full autofocus support with those tele extenders on the older versions. You will with the G2 versions of those lenses. All right, so it looks like that is all the questions, and we've run out of time. If you have follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out to me. We will. We have been recording this presentation, and so we will send out. Everybody who is registered will get a link to that recording so that you can watch it again if you'd like. I want to thank all of you for joining me today, for submitting those questions, a couple of those tips that we got along the way. And thank you to Tamron for sponsoring today's presentation. Don't forget to share. If you already have some Tamron lenses and you've got some great photos you'd like to share with the world, be sure to use that hashtag with my Tamron to share those. And again, you can check out that gallery of user photos as well. So thanks again for joining us today, and I'll hope to see you again on a future Gray Learning webinar.